Our New Testament reading today is Revelation chapter 5. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls and full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked, and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying in a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea all that is in them, saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. Let's turn now to our Old Testament reading, Ruth chapter 2. Now, Naomi had a relative of her husband's, a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after him, in whose sight I shall find favor. And she, and she said to her, Go, my daughter. So she set out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers, and she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the clan of Elimelech. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem, and he said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered, The Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his young man who was in charge of the reapers, Whose young woman is this? And the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered, she is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, Please let me glean and gather among the sheaves after the reapers. So she came, and she has continued from early morning until now, except for a short rest. Then Boaz said to Ruth, Now, listen, my daughter, do not go glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping, and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes, that you should take notice of me, since I am a foreigner? But Boaz answered her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law 
since the death of your husband had been fully told to me, and how you left your father and mother and your native land and came to a people that you did not know before. The Lord repay you for what you have done, and a full reward be given you by the Lord, the, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Then she said, I have found favor in your eyes, O my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, though I am not one of your servants. And at mealtime Boaz said to her, Come here and eat some bread and dip your morsel in the wine. So she sat beside the reapers, and he passed her roasted grain, and she ate until she was satisfied, and she had some left over. When she rose to glean, Boaz instructed his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and do not reproach her. And also put out, pull out some from the bundles for her, and leave it for her to glean, and do not rebuke her. So she gleaned in the field until evening. Then she beat out what she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. And she took it up and went into the city. Her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. She also brought out and gave her what food she had left over after being satisfied. And her mother-in-law said to her, Where did you glean today? And where have you worked? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. She told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked, and said, The man's name with whom I work today is Boaz. And Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, May he be blessed by the Lord, whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. Naomi also said to her, The man is a close relative of ours, one of our redeemers. And Ruth the Moabite said, Besides, he said to me, You shall keep close by my young men until they have finished all my harvest. And Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that you go out with his young women, lest in another field you should be assaulted. So she kept close to the young women of Boaz, gleaning until the end of the barley and wheat harvests, and she lived with her mother-in-law. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we praise you for preserving your word for us. And so we pray right now that you're, you would send your Holy Spirit to reveal this truth, to open our minds and hearts that we may see the glory of you, our Father, the great grace that we have received in Jesus Christ. We pray these things in his name alone. Amen. In chapter 1, we saw Ruth and Naomi are coming back to Judah, but they had left, Naomi had left Judah with her family because of the great famine. And in her time away in Moab, she has suffered great tragedy. Her husband has died, and both of her sons have died, and it has just left her and her two daughters-in-law. And not only is she mourning, but she is overcome with a great bitterness. To the point at the end of the chapter, she says, don't even call me Naomi anymore. Because her name, Naomi, means pleasant. But rather call me Mara, meaning bitter. We see at the very, very end of that chapter that it is the beginning of barley harvest. The Lord has started to bless the land of Judah again. The land of Israel has been returned to the graces of the Lord. And yet... Despite the blessings of the Lord being on the land, when Naomi and Ruth return, harvest time is a great blessing, except for the fact that they were in Moab. They weren't in Judah when it was time to plant. So when they come and they are back in Judah, they have possession of Elimelech's land, but there is no food in it. No one has planted. It's time for harvest. The time for planting is over. And so now they are in a, a state of poverty and need. And they don't have anything to get by. They have empty land. They have no head of household. And in fact, Naomi is still distraught because she does not have an heir. There is no son who will take care of her in her old age. There is no son who will inherit this land from them this ancestral land that was passed down from the time of Joshua when they conquered and gave out land. This land goes to this family. This land goes to that family. That is passed down from family to family to family, and it is supposed to stay there. But with Elimelech dead, 
and his son said, his inheritance, his legacy, his name will be gone away. It will be absorbed into some other family, and he will be forgotten. So Naomi is not done with her bitterness yet. But there is hints and signs of hope in this passage. There is a new person coming into view. And we are going to spend our time looking through this passage to see, is this Boaz truly a reason for hope? Is this someone who can bring Naomi out of her bitterness? Not just her bitterness, but out of her, her state of poverty and need. This is a particular story that truly, truly happened. This is a piece of history. But it's a reflection of the fallenness that we can all experience and witness. Our neediness and poverty. Perhaps you have experienced not having enough. Perhaps you have witnessed it in your life or in people that you know. We surely see it all around the world that this is not the way that it's supposed to be. Why is there pain? Why is there sorrow? Why is there never seem to be quite enough? Is there hope that can answer this neediness, this poverty that plagues the earth? On a spiritual side as well, we don't want to only spiritualize it, but on a spiritual side as well, we know that we are needy people. None of us can go to the Lord with our own morality, with our, with our own good works, and say, see, I have, I have enough. We are all in a state of spiritual poverty. What is a sign of hope? Who could give us hope? As we go through this passage, I want to focus on three key words that come up, and these all are in reference to Boaz that we need to uh, see and evaluate, is this a man who can bring hope to Naomi and Ruth? The first is the word worthy. Is he suited to the job? Can he actually save him, save them if he even wanted to? The second word is favor. This shows up a few times. Is he willing to save them even if he is able to? Is he loyal to the covenant of God? Does he show that steadfast love that he ought to? And the last word is redeemer. Is, it, is he set apart for this purpose? Is it his place to do such a thing? Is he even allowed to? Those three words, worthy, favor, and redeemer. If these three words truly apply to Boaz, if we can see that they truly describe him, then he would be a fitting answer to their plight. He would be a true reason for them to hope that things may turn around, that they may be happy again. Let's look through the passage starting in verse 1. We read, Now Naomi had a relative of her husband's, a worthy man, of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. This we have a little narrator's aside. Before we get into the story, the narrator has special knowledge. Even though Naomi's still calling herself Mara and bitter, the narrator gives us a little clue. He doesn't call her Mara, he calls her Naomi. And then he gives a little introduction, a pre-introduction to who is coming onto the scene next this man called Boaz, who is described as worthy. And this word in Hebrew is gibor. It is a, a word meaning valiant. Uh, many, it is often described uh, warriors and kings. The might, David's mighty men were his gibor. And it is used metaphorically at times to show somebody as being respected or influential. After all, this is a man who is who is a landowner. He is a man of the community. He's not out fighting battle right now, so this is more of a metaphorical use. He is somebody who is an upstanding man. He is a man of substance in the community. He is likely wealthy, a man who has what it takes, basically, to save them. And worthy is, is, an, is apt because it shows that he has what it takes, but not necessarily that he would be willing to. 
It doesn't really show a light on his character. So what we know is that there is this man, Boaz, and he is well-to-do, and he is well-respected. But we don't know, there's still that tension of, is he the sort of man who is willing to actually help in time of need? And to kind of illustrate this idea of worthiness and fittingness to actually save, if someone is drowning you see outside of the boat, and you don't have anything you can throw to them, it is not fitting. A person who does not know how to swim is not worthy to jump in and grab hold of them. Because if you can't swim, and you jump into the water, and you hold on to them, what are you going to do? You're just going to make them sink even worse. This is, not, this is not a worthy savior in this instance. The worthy person will be the one who is a strong swimmer, somebody who is actually able and mighty to save. In the next verse, uh, we see Ruth and Naomi discussing what Ruth should do. And she says, I'm going to go out and glean in the fields. They don't, have, they don't have food. They don't have what they need. They're in deep poverty. So she, she is going to go out to the fields. She says the field. What, it, what we had here is a, a city. And then to the side, there is one great field. And it is partitioned off. And each different partition is owned by a different landowner. And so she's going to go out to this one singular field to, do, to, to get food, and she's going to have to look for someone for whom she can find favor with, right? Because some people aren't going to let her take food from there. And yet, if she finds favor with someone, she may take food from there portion of land. And we'll get a little bit into more, more into to gleaning and um, what that means. As Boaz comes back from Bethlehem, this is an interesting portion. We see that she so happened to go to the field that Boaz owned, and then it just so happened that Boaz was returning from Bethlehem at that time. And I think this is an excellent perspective of what it looks like to live in the providence of God, that God is working in and through your life. But for us, we are not prophets and priests and kings. We are not like Moses, who God spoke to audibly. We don't see these great visions in our minds to explain to us, like to Joseph, what exactly is going on. We're normal people like Naomi and Ruth, and we just see God's providence working out in our lives. And it just so happened that she walked into this field of Boaz, and it just so happened that Boaz shows up that day. And he asks his uh, man who is in charge of the reapers, who is this, whose woman is this? That's how he phrases it. He says, whose woman is this? Not who is she? but rather she's a person who is working, but she is gleaning. And I'll tell you why that's an important question, because gleaning and taking food is something that only the deeply impoverished would do. There is a law given in Leviticus that God has given to the people of Israel because he loved and cared for the needy and poor. He said, when you reap the harvest of your land, this is Leviticus 19, verses 9 and 10, you shall not reap your fill field right up to its edge, neither shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. And you shall not strip your vineyard bare, neither shall you gather the fallen grapes in your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. I am the Lord your God. This was something that was required of the people of Israel, to be generous. Do not take every last scrap of food out of your field, but leave some there. If you drop something on the ground, don't pick it up. Leave that for the people who need it. And we see God's great care and love for the poor and sojourner, both of those things which apply to Ruth herself, both poor and a sojourner in the land of Israel. And so... Ruth is here, and she has two options. She can pick up what is dropped by the reapers following behind them, and there's also this border around the field that she may take from. But the problem is that in the time of the judges, we know that people were not obedient. Many people went against the laws of the Lord, and we see three times in this passage, there's a sense of this isn't really safe. 
Yes, the law says you can do this. Yes, you're, they're supposed to allow it, but Boaz has to warn his, tell his young men instruction, don't lay a hand on her. And Naomi at the end says, yeah, stay in his field. Otherwise, if you go to somebody else's field, they might assault you. Because even though they were required to do it by law, many people would just look at them and say, this riffraff is taking my food. I worked hard to plant it. Get out of here. Didn't you know we just had a famine? I need all I can get. That is why it is so important for Ruth to find someone she can find favor with. Someone who will show favor towards her. Here at this point, we see that Boaz notices Ruth because she has been working from early morning until now with just a short break. And in the following section, we see further that he is impressed by her because he has heard about what she has done. He has heard that she was loyal to Naomi. She stuck with her. She followed her away from her family of origin, away from the country she knew. She stayed loyal to Naomi. And that struck Boaz. He said, he said to her, the Lord repay you for what you have done. But I'm getting a little bit of head. Let's look back and see. So Boaz has inquired to his, to his servant about who this woman is. And so the next section of verses that we see is verses uh, 8 to 13. And that's when Boaz and Ruth actually interact. He is going to her because he is, he is inquired, who is this woman? Who, uh, who is, is she? What family is in such need that they're sending out someone to glean? If there's somebody gleaning, that means that there is a household in desperate need. So whose is she? She's Naomi's. And so she goes to her. So he goes to her and says, now listen, my daughter, do not glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. He's giving her protection because he knows the dangers that are out there. He is fulfilling what the law requires of him. And her response to his graciousness is, Why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? And that's the second time we hear the word favor, and we'll hear it again. The word favor here is uh, a word meaning graciousness, to, so, to show a rich generosity. Why are you showing me such favor and such generosity? This is something that ought to have been done. This is something that was actually required of the people of Israel, but nobody else, not everybody else was doing it. And so in her eyes, for him to be loyal to the covenant with God, for him to actually show a covenant faithfulness is this graciousness. But she doesn't know what graciousness, what graciousness is yet to come. This is just the base level. This is just plain obedience. Boaz responds to her, I've shown you favor because of what you have done. All that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me, and how you left your father and mother and your native land and came to a people that you did not know before. The Lord repay you for what you have done, and a full reward be given to you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. She responds, I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, though I am not one of your servants. We can clearly answer the question of favor now. This is a man who does show favor to her. I, we, we, we don't fully know exactly how much he has. Can he truly support Ruth and Naomi? Well, that answer isn't really answered up to this point, but we do see that he is generous, that he is loyal to the covenant of the Lord, that he, if he is able, he is willing. He, show, he has shown her favor. In the next section, we'll look at verses 14 through 18. 
And this really answers not just is he willing, but above and beyond, is he truly able to support another family coming in to his household? Because he's already got people to support. In verses 14 and following, we see that they have a meal together, and Boaz invites her to come eat. He gives her roasted grain, and they are dipping into the cup of wine. And it says that she ate and was satisfied and had some left over. This is not to show that she had a small appetite. It is rather to show the abundance of food that he is shoving towards her, right? Take this, take more, take more. After all, she, she wouldn't have had a small appetite working from early morning. She would, have been, she would have needed to eat her fill to get energy to do that work. And so what we see is a superabundance, a generosity of spirit that Boaz is showing to her. When she rose to glean again, Boaz instructed the young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and do not reproach her. And pull out some from the bundles for her, and leave it for her to glean, and do not rebuke her. He's not afraid of not having enough for himself, for his family, for his servants. He says, this, these, these sections are not allowed to be gleaned from. The law does not apply to this. What he's doing is above and beyond. He's taking out of what has already been harvested and throwing it on the ground for her to come and pick up. And if she takes anything that isn't technically allowed, do not rebuke her. Rather, give her more and more and more. He's not afraid of his own loss. He is giving. It may be to his own detriment, but he is not afraid. He has a, a superabundance. We can see from this that he is clearly worthy. He has what it takes. He is a gibor, a worthy man, able to take on the cost. And we'll see how this plays out as she gleans in the field all day from early morning until evening. And it says she, she, she beats out all of the grain and she measures it and it's about an ephah of barley. Now, an ephah is, about, is a measure of volume about 22 liters. So if you can picture in your mind a two liter bottle, you can picture 11 of those. If you can't picture 11, picture five, and then another five, and then there's one. So that's the amount of barley that she is lugging home and one day of work. It's about 30 pounds of barley. That's, it would take at least two weeks for any other gleaner to, to gain that much. And she's done it in one day because of the generosity of, of Boaz. This amount of food was enough to take a person entirely through the months of winter in one day. She's not, she's not some rich landowner who's, who's able to go out and do one day of work and survive for three months. She is a beggar. And yet by the generosity of Boaz, she is gained a superabundance. In the last scene, we see Ruth bringing this information to Naomi. It says, and her mother-in-law said to her, where did you glean today? And where have you worked? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. She told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, the man's name with whom I work today is Boaz. And Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, may he be blessed by the Lord whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. That line might strike you a little bit funny. What, what is she talking about that his love didn't, didn't, isn't forsaking the living or the dead? This is the second time that she has brought this up, the living or the dead. She's referring to her husband and her sons, specifically. This comes up in her next sentence. She says, the man is a close relative of ours, one of our redeemers. A redeemer was a very important role in Israel. Somebody, he is a relative whose obligation was to care for, for the family members through, who were in desperate need. If somebody was sold into slavery, your redeemer, your kinsman redeemer, would buy you back. If you were so impoverished that you had to sell your ancestral lands, your kinsman redeemer would buy it back so that it would be in the family again. 
And in this case, particularly, if somebody marries into the, if a woman marries into the family and the husband dies and does not have an heir, like in this particular case, where there's no name to, they're not, there's no one carrying on the name, there's no one carrying, out, carrying on the inheritance, it is not passed down, it is not kept. It is the kinsman redeemer's obligation to marry that widow and then to provide a son, and that first son would be attributed to the dead husband. That way, his name is kept on, his legacy is kept on, his inheritance will go forward and not be absorbed into somebody else's family. And so Naomi's looking, and she's looking far ahead, right? This man who has not forsaken the living, us, because he's feeding us right now, or the dead, because he's a redeemer. Someone who can come in and who can faithfully fulfill his obligations to my dead husband, to my dead sons, who don't have their name passed on, whose inheritance will be lost. I think we can clearly see that Boaz is a true reason for hope. At this point, he hasn't done anything to actually redeem them. He hasn't done anything to actually take completely away their plight. He has given them above and beyond generously. This is fantastic for a person in poverty to have meal through the winter. What a generous spirit. But the reason for hope that they have is that he is one able, he has shown that he has an abundance, he has the power to take care of them. Two, he is the person who shows favor, and he is obeying the laws of gleaning. He's allowing people to come in and take what they ought to be able to take. And if he is loyal to those laws, surely he will be loyal to the covenant laws that say he ought to marry the widow who has married into his family. This is a faithful, loyal man who shows favor. He's worthy. He shows favor. And last of all, he is clearly a redeemer. He is one of our redeemers, one of our close relatives whose obligation it is to save, whose place it is to save. It is right and true for him to do so. Boaz is a reason for them to hope. And how much more reason do we have to hope? Because as worthy and faithful a redeemer as Boaz is, we have one who is more worthy, who is more, who shows more favor, our true redeemer who is Jesus Christ. Boaz was worthy for Ruth and Naomi in that one particular time. He could alleviate their hunger. He could alleviate their poverty. He had land and food and money and standing in society. Yet how much more worthy is Christ to alleviate our plight, the sin and death of this world? Anyone who sins deserves death and judgment from God. Who can be worthy before him? What a plight we have. Who could be worthy except Christ, who is very God of very God, perfect and sinless? He took on flesh to be our substitute. He bore the judgment that was due to us. He suffered and died. Truly, we can proclaim like they do in Revelation, worthy is the lamb that was slain. He is the true worthy one, the one who can really, really save us. He is the one with the power, with the ability. He is the only one. God is the only one who saves. Boaz showed great favor to Ruth. His favor was lived out of that loyalty to God's law and covenant. And to even go above and beyond to obey the spirit of the law, to love the poor and needy, to give and to give generously. 
he stuck to that agreement in gleaning, even though others did not stick to it, though others would have abused her. And he did so even though it was a cost to himself. That was grain, three months of food that he could have sold. He could have bought more land. He could have done anything with that, but he gave it away. How much more do we see the favor of God, though, and the love and favor of Christ Jesus? He is loyal to his covenant promises, even though we have not been. Boaz had a reason to look on Ruth with favor. Look at how hard she works. Look how loyal she was to Naomi. She has done these wonderful things. Of course, I'm going to do something for her because she is a righteous woman. But Christ has loved us, not because of the works that we have done. We have done nothing to earn his love from him. We cannot go to him and demand his favor and say, look what I have done. Look how good I am. No, he has shown favor far above that of Boaz in that he has loved the unlovely. He has taken us and he is making us into his image that we may be righteous, that we may be lovely as he is. And Christ has not only given us a clean slate, he doesn't just give us enough food for the day or for a couple weeks, but in his Son, he has granted us access to heaven and eternal life. Please do not try to earn that on your own. It is completely impossible. Who is worthy to earn eternal life in heaven? Except Christ. Except the Son of God himself. The truly worthy one. The truly loyal one. Christ has shown generosity to us who are sinners. Boaz here was also seen to be a redeemer. The law called on him as a relative to buy back what was lost to the family. Someone in his position was supposed to care for people, for hurting members within the clan. Through him, the dead would have an heir. The ancestral lands would be passed down and their inheritance would not be lost. But how much greater is what Christ has done? He did not have to be our redeemer. He was not obligated by law, but chose to out of love and covenant faithfulness. It was not demanded of him. But it was because his father's great love for us that he would send him. And he does not just care for one family, not just his own personal blood relatives, but it says in the passage of Revelation that every family on earth. He's taking people from every tribe and language and people and nation. It is not a microscopic little, I'm going to be loyal to these people, but rather I'm going to redeem people from all over who look different, who speak differently, who are different in all sorts of ways, who are not related to me and who do not deserve it. And through Christ... The dead are not passing down their name and their inheritance, but rather he does something even better because even the dead, they receive Christ's name. Their name isn't passed down. They receive Christ's name, and they receive his inheritance because truly it's the greater who passes down inheritance to the lesser. And so what Boaz is as a redeemer, Christ is all the more. And seeing so worthy and loyal a Redeemer, let us all the more praise his name and look to him. Take refuge under his wings in our time of need. You have reason to hope. Though the world is dark, though times are hard, though poverty comes, you have reason to hope in the worthy, loyal Redeemer of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Thank you.